I am Bob Hershon. I am program director here at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And uh, I'm also uh, a member of the education and public outreach team of NASA's Messenger Mission to Planet Mercury. And uh, I just mentioned that because that's my, my biggest connection to space science right now. And if you haven't heard of it, Messenger is um, a spacecraft that is orbiting the planet Mercury. And it's the first spacecraft ever to orbit that planet. So just think about that. It's the first close-up look we've ever had at this planet that isn't even that far from us. It's, you know, it's the first planet from the sun. And uh, it's very tricky to get into orbit around it. And so until very recently, we weren't able to do it. But now we are there. And uh, you know, if you go online and look under Messenger um, and NASA, you will get all sorts of information and close-up looks at that planet. And we're like the first human beings ever to see most of the surface of that planet. So it just it reminds me of a quote. Um, this was told to be by a Nobel Prize uh, laureate, Leon Letterman. One of his students wrote a report for him. And in it, it uh, said that space research lets us go where no human eyeball has ever set foot. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, think about it. And it's true. And all of our researchers here, the space scientists that are going to be talking to us, all um, get, that, you know, get that opportunity to be part of seeing unknown territory, getting to see things that no human being has ever seen before. And sometimes it's a look back at Earth and seeing things about Earth that we never knew before, even though they're doing it from space. So, uh, but before I go any further, I do want to thank our sponsors, Verizon Foundation and the Thinkfinity Program. And uh, that's a, a, a program that helps educators use the internet to um, explore new worlds of learning. Uh, and, and it includes AAAS's own ScienceNet links, which is a great, uh, a great resource for science teachers. I also want to thank NASA Federal Credit Union. They are a valued partner of AAAS, and they provide outstanding financial services to our members and to the science community as a whole. And despite their name, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to be a member. And you can learn more um, right uh, at the website for this event. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the AAAS Directorate for Education and Human Resources Programs and their Flexible Action Fund donors. And these are donations that are designated for education and public outreach that we might not otherwise be able to do here at AAAS that aren't funded otherwise. And uh, I also want to uh, welcome our viewers on our chat stream, online on our web stream, rather, and wanted to say to them that if they have any questions at any point, they can type them into the chat. And uh, that will be included uh, in the program. We'll have someone repeat the question, and then we'll put it to our panelists so they can participate from wherever they are. And um, let me just tell you a little bit about how this, oh, and of course, thanks to you guys, our live audience here from St. Francis and Sacred Heart and Burroughs for taking the time to be with us here today. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, here's how it's going to work. Each of our speakers is going to come up and speak for a few minutes, and then go back down um, to you know to the to the gallery here, and then but when they're all done, they're going to all sit up here and then take your questions, and you can ask them anything you want uh, about careers and space, you know anything that uh, you know that you're interested in. So, without any further hesitation, we will begin, and our first speaker is Susan Wolfenbarger. She's a geographer, but uh, that doesn't really tell you half of it because she does geospatial stuff. She does geography from space. And one of the cool things about it is she is sort of like a detective up there looking for answers to crimes that are happening here on Earth. And she provides information that can't otherwise be discovered about, say, you know, military groups that go in and you know, maybe kill people in a village or do you know, really bad stuff. And they think there are no witnesses and they can get away, get away with it. But uh, with Dr. Wolfenbarger and her team, they can actually get evidence of that from space. So please welcome Dr. Susan Wolfenbarger. Hi, everybody. Well, maybe I should say good morning. good morning. 
Thank you. That's a tradition we have here at AAAS, is to always welcome everybody to a new event. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I got to where I am. But first, I wanted to start off with a question for you guys. So how many of you have used on your cell phone or maybe your parents' cell phones something like Google Maps, and you've used it to figure out exactly where you are and look at maps? Yeah? Everybody. OK. Do you know how your cell phone figures that out and tells you where you're at? Exactly. Satellites. There's all these satellites that are orbiting around the Earth, and these are global positioning satellites. And they, go, they locate your phone and then tell you where you are. There are also a whole number of other satellites that are orbiting around the Earth, and those are some of the ones that I use in my work. So I want to explain to you kind of how I became a geographer first. And really that started when I was in elementary school, and I started drawing maps by hand. I, the first map I ever made was of Christopher Columbus's voyages, and I got out this great piece of construction paper and my crayons, and I drew this beautiful map, and I've just loved maps ever since. But I don't want you to think that being a geographer is just about maps. We, we don't just draw maps all the time. We don't only just worry about where China is located or maybe what the capital of Egypt is. With geography, we study people and we study places. And we ask questions about the world. We ask you know, where things are located and why and how those interactions with people and their places create the things that we see on the face of the earth. So you can do a whole lot of careers in geography besides just the kind of stuff that I do. You can study city planning, you could do tourism, you can do disaster response. There's so many things that you can do as a geographer. But I started as a geographer in college and I just fell in love with it. And I realized you know, I'd been a geographer since I'd been a kid, and I just didn't know it. So I learned to start making maps using GIS. GIS is Geographic Information Systems, and it's a way of making digital maps like you see on Google Earth and on Google Maps, instead of drawing them on construction paper and with crayons like I used to do. So if you... Uh, one of the things that you also use within mapping is remote sensing. And the best way to understand what remote sensing is, is to think of Google Earth. How many of you guys have used Google Earth? Yeah? Most of you? Okay. So Google Earth is a way to look at satellite imagery. And th these are high resolution satellite images. So this image you see up here, I got off of Google Earth, and this is downtown Washington, D.C. So I've marked a few things of of importance on here. So the Washington Monument is here in the middle, and you can see the monument and then the shadow that it's casting. And then I marked out the White House and the Capitol. So these are these images that you find on Google Earth are collected by satellites that are orbiting hundreds of miles up in space. And these images are the same type of images that I use in my work in documenting human rights. So, speaking of human rights, I started learning about human rights while I, also while I was in college, and human rights are really, really important today. And I think if you listen to the news even just a little bit, you'll know about some things about human rights and some human rights situations that are going on. Um, some of the worst things that are happening in the world today, I think you'll probably know about. So, for example, in Sudan, if you, if you guys have heard of Darfur, there's been conflict going on in Darfur for 10 years now. And so there's been all of these villages that have been destroyed, and people are having to flee from the places that they live and go to these IDP camps. And IDP stands for internally displaced persons. And they have to go, and they live in these camps for years and years. So think about what would happen if you had to leave your home and go and live in a camp where, you know, there. You couldn't work, you couldn't go to school, you, you didn't have any money. What, what would your life be like? So that's, that's one of the ways that you can think of human rights is to put yourself in the situation of the of people. 
And another, another really serious human rights issue that's going on right now, you may have heard about, is the civil war that's happening in Syria. And so there's lots of conflict going on right now. Um, for example, in the city of Aleppo, there is lots of fighting going on. So imagine if we had a civil war here now. I'm sure you've studied about the civil war in school. But what if it was happening here now? What if there were tanks going through the streets of Washington, D.C., and there were bombs going off? What would that do to your lives if, if you were afraid to leave your homes? So these are the kind, this is ways that you can think about human rights. So I, I, I was so interested in human rights and what was going on, and I wanted to be able to make a difference using the tools that I have as a geographer. And I wanted to help other people improve their lives. And so I figured out that human rights documentation is all about finding ways to prove that people have done bad things to other people and hopefully be able to prosecute them to make them pay for their crimes. And so the project that I run, Geospatial Technologies and Human Rights, we're three people. Um, we actually sit just upstairs here at AAAS. And we use remote sensing to document human rights abuses. And using remote sensing is really important because it lets us, with the satellites that are up in space, look down on places that are too dangerous for people to go to. So you can't go into the middle of a civil war in Syria or into a really remote location in Darfur. So satellites give us access to places that we couldn't get to otherwise. So we're taking this ability with the technology and using it to provide evidence of crimes that are happening around the world. So now I want to give you a couple of examples now that I've kind of given you a background to geography and human rights. Let's see if I get this to work right. All right. So we started off, I showed you first that we were in Washington, D.C., and we took a, took a look, quick look at the mall and everything in D.C. So now I want to fly you over to show you a couple of the projects that we've done. And the first is in Libya. So now we're going to fly across the ocean over to the top of Africa to Misrata, which is a port city in Libya. So this is the city. Let's zoom in a little bit. You can see once you get down, 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 then you can start seeing individual roads and buildings and everything. So this is Miserata. And this is the first place that I want to talk to you about. So I want to make a distinction between human rights and conflict. So you can have conflict happening, but not human rights abuses happening. So this, this first set of images is from the war that was happening in Libya a couple of years ago. And I wanted to show you this image, one, because satellite images, even though we're studying human rights abuses, are kind of cool. So you can see, so this first image is from March 4th, and this is of an airstrip in Miserata. And here are some... Um, planes and helicopters from the Libyan army. And then this image is from just a couple weeks later on March 28th. And you see these big black marks and these holes. And this is from bombing that it was an international airstrike on that airfield. And so all of those planes and the helicopters were destroyed. But these aren't, this isn't a human rights abuse because it was between two, two combatants. Civilians weren't involved. So when we want to think about human rights, we start looking at things where civilians are in, involved, where people like us are getting involved in a conflict. So this is also in the same city, and this is in the middle of the downtown. And here is a central food market where lots of people went and did their shopping. And so it was targeted and attacked. So this is the same location that you just saw with the blue and silver roof. And so it was burned, and so you can see there's some outlines of the interior walls that were left. So the entire roof is gone, and it was burned. And so here, and then up by B and C, you can see all these, um, these holes, and these are craters where, where the bombs actually dropped within the city. So, kind of, so you have to kind of think, you know, people are living in all of these buildings that are around here, and then all, and bombs are dropping. Think about what that would be if that was your city. All right, we're going to do another fly down 
to port a farm in Zimbabwe. And this is to show you a different type of human rights abuse that's not related directly to conflict. So port a farm is this small, small town way down in Zimbabwe near the bottom of Africa. So this is what port a farm looks like if you zoomed way, way, way down. And so port a farm was a town with about 850 different buildings in it, and about 10,000 people were living there. And they were targeted by the government to have their homes demolished. So you see, when we switch to the after image, all the buildings are gone. Let me flip back and forth. So you see this whole big town, and everything has been destroyed. And the, all the people were forcibly evicted from their homes. So this is clearly a human rights abuse, and this is something that we documented, and we provided this to some, the African Court of Human Rights. So this is being used to try to bring people to justice for what they did there. So just to wrap up, we visited Washington, D.C., looking at high-resolution satellite images. We flew over to Libya, and then we flew down to Zimbabwe. And I hope that you kind of have a better idea of what satellite imagery can do. And satellites, they, you know, even though they are up in space, they can teach us lots of things about what's happening on the Earth and help us to help other people's lives get better. Thank you. All right, and again, we'll have time for questions uh, at the very end. Our next speaker is Dr. David Grinspoon. He's an astrobiologist, and you know we've seen so many science fiction movies and things with aliens from outer space that we kind of think, oh yeah, there's aliens all over the place. There's all sorts of, some of them have tentacles, some of them have nine eyes, and, and they're everywhere. But actually, you know, there is no uh, evidence yet of any life existing outside of Earth. But Dr. Grinspoon and people who um, you know, study astrobiology are looking for the things, the telltale signs that might lead us to find life on other worlds. So please welcome Dr. David Grinspoon. All right. Um, yeah, do you know how I get to my uh, PowerPoint? Good, good morning. Thanks a lot for coming out. Uh, it's great to see you all here, and, and thanks to the uh, AAAS for including me in this fun program. Um, I, uh, as mentioned, I'm an astrobiologist, which uh, is, uh, astrobiology is the scientific study of life in the universe. So we're interested in the question of where there could, yeah, that's me, thanks. Yeah. Where, and is it this, this thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, awesome, Great. thanks. <laughs> it's okay, we're rocket scientists here. We know how to do these things. The scientific study of, of, of uh, where there might be life in the universe. So we, we uh, study the history of life on Earth very carefully and try to understand what it is about Earth that has allowed life to flourish here and then uh, understand how we can extend that to the rest of the universe. And a big part of that is we explore the other planets and try to understand in general how planets work. And we do something called comparative planetology, where uh, these, are, these are the planets in our solar system, and um, we uh, sort of look at the similarities and differences and try to understand in general how planets work. And a lot of this has taught us a lot about our own planet. So by going out there and studying other examples, we get smarter about our planet and how to manage it and take care of it and also understand the, what life is doing here and what we are doing here in this wider context of what else might be out there. So my, uh, what I studied in school was mostly plant, what we call planetary science, just uh, exploring the planets and how, how they work. Um, and then from that I got into this question of astrobiology, what kind of life might be out there. And for me, as a kid, I was really enchanted by, uh, when I was in fourth grade, the, um, uh, am I on, by the way, my mic thing? Can you guys? Yeah, but, it, well, I, yeah. Okay, if you guys, if you guys can hear me, you can hear me. Um, but um, wh when I was in the fourth grade, the uh, astronauts landed on the moon, the Apollo astronauts, and uh, this was 
just kind of blew my mind. I remember um, watching this on TV and I, that the actual time of day where I was living, it was in the middle of the night and my parents let me stay up later than I ever stayed up and that in itself was exciting. But then <laughs> seeing, seeing these guys step on the moon, it seemed like a science fiction movie, but it was real and it, uh, it was very, very much influenced me and, and partly as a result of that I got into, um, let's see, how do, oh, I could probably do this. I'm looking for a button to push to advance this thing. Ah, how about this button? Yes! <laughs> cool. Um, I, partly as a result of that, I got really into reading science fiction books, and I, I just got really, uh, my imagination was captivated by the idea of people, that people could go to space, and reading about this sort of fantasy of space, and then I was learning that the actual space stuff was happening. We were sending the first missions to Venus and Mars, and in my mind, that all kind of mixed together, and I just became this kind of... Uh, I guess, space geek kid. And then I dis discovered you could actually do this for a job, which for me, in a way, is the equivalent of not ever really fully having to grow up and get a job because I, could, I found out that I could keep being into what I was into and study it and learn it and keep, keep doing it. So in a way, in my career, I, you could say I've worked really hard. I've spent a lot of hours at it. But in another way, I feel like I've never actually had to go to work because the stuff I spend my time doing and stuff that I love doing. Anyways, um, yeah, so we, we uh, compare the planets, Venus on the left, Earth, and Mars. There are a lot of planets out there, but to me this comparison is what I've spent a lot of time on because Venus and Mars are the most Earth-like planets, and I'm very interested in how a planet can be something like the Earth, but go off in a different direction, and what do we, what do we learn from that? So that's a lot of what I've studied. And through that, I've gotten to be part of a lot of teams that work on spacecraft. And that's really cool. This is the launch, actually, of a uh, um, spacecraft that's, that's going to Pluto. It's going to get there in the year 2015. So it's actually almost there. It launched in the year 2006. And I was at that launch. Being at a launch is very exciting. And people work on these projects for years. And then there's that moment where it's going to go up. And you don't know. It might blow up. Something might go wrong. It's, you're nervous, but you're also excited. And then when it goes off, everybody cheers and hugs each other. And there's this sense of being part of a team that is succeeding at something that takes years and years. And then you get to explore new places. So there, there's, there's wonderful and, and sort of terrifying aspects of it, too. This is a spacecraft, a, a, an artist's conception of a spacecraft, spacecraft called Venus Express. This is one of the projects that I, that I work on. This, this spacecraft is now in orbit around the planet Venus, studying what the weather and climate of that planet are like. And what's been neat about this project that I've, well, a lot of things are neat. It's fun, like I said, to be part of a project that is actually exploring and learning new things. But also, this so is a European Space Agency spacecraft. It's not NASA. This one was done by Europe. But since I'm a NASA person on the team, I go to all the meetings, and they're all in Europe. Um, so that's kind of been very, really fun for me. The team meets in France and Italy and Spain and England and Germany and one time in Moscow and Sweden. And so in addition to exploring the solar system, I get to explore Europe through being part of this. So that's been, been really fun. There's also, you've probably heard about this rover on Mars that we landed last year. This is the Curiosity rover. And I, I've also been able to be part of this project, and that's been really fun and exciting. And actually, uh, I don't think this laser pointer, I don't think, oh, yeah, maybe I, I do have a laser pointer that's working. You see this thing? So this is the Curiosity rover on, on Mars. And you see this, this circular thing that looks like the top of a coffee can? Mm -hmm. That's my instrument. <laughs> it's not mine like, oh, I made it myself in my garage, but a team of people, of which I am one of the people, uh, we uh, proposed this idea about 10 years ago and said, hey, can we put this instrument on this rover? We'll learn things. And we competed against other groups. We were selected. And then here we are. We actually now have something that we designed and made on Mars. And this is, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's called RAD. For the, it's the Radiation Assessment Detector. So it's RAD. And, um, and what we're doing with that instrument is measuring the, the, the actual amount of different kinds of radiation on the surface of Mars, which has never been done before. There's all this radiation coming from the sun, some of which would be very dangerous to you and other living organisms, 
that we're protected from here on Earth by the atmosphere, but on Mars, with its very, very thin atmosphere, that radiation reaches the ground. And we're interested in what that might do to possible organisms or possible future human astronauts on Mars. So um, it's working, and, and uh, it's, it's been very exciting to be part of that team. Now, um, in my career as a scientist, in addition to the research, I've been fortunate to have a lot of opportunities to do uh, what we call outreach and education, including what I'm doing right now, talking with you guys. And um, I worked at a university for a while. I was a professor. That was a great experience in, uh, oh, I need to talk in the mic. OK, thanks. You know, maybe what happens if I hit, do that? I think I might have just turned on the. Anyways, you can hear me. So I'll just stand. Oh, I'm, I'm on now? OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, I worked in a university for a while. I was a professor. And that was a really good experience in some ways because it got me really used to um, talking to people in public. Like, you know, when you, you first get up and talk to people, you might be kind of nervous. Well, honestly, I wasn't nervous at all about standing here and talking to you guys. But there was a time when I would have been. But the experience of teaching day in, day out, you just you sort of get tired of being nervous. And so you forget. You, you, you're not anymore. So I, I like that part of it. But then um, now I work at a museum. And I like that in some ways a lot better because I talk to a much wider range of people, not just students that are university students, but anybody that comes to the museum, which is kids, old people, anybody who's interested. And then I go out and educate a lot of other people, too. So I love that. And here, here I am in the Mars display at the museum, hamming it up with some visitors and having a good time. And um, I've written a couple of books. This is another kind of outreach thing. So if you, go, if you get into science, obviously you can do the research. But there are a lot of other things you can do if you like to communicate about science. And so I've uh, had the opportunity to write a couple of books. This one is, uh, is about Venus, called Venus Revealed. This one's um, about aliens. It's called Lonely Planets. Make sure and run out and buy them, kids. <laughs> or tell your parents to. No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to, but you really should. No. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and then I, do, I, I get to do some other fun things. This is, this is, these are pictures from a program that I was involved in. It's called NASA and the Navajo Nation Space Camp, where for a couple of summers, we've gone to the Navajo Nation, which is down in New Mexico and Arizona. And we've worked with middle school kids from the Navajo Nation. Uh, and we go all around. Um, to these different geological sites, and we do um, these, these field trips, and we talk about the scientific story of the land. And then they also have some Navajo elders who talk about the cultural stories of the land. So we learn a lot, too. And, um, and the kids are great, and we've had a really good time. I'm hoping I get to do it again. So um, in addition to hopefully the kids getting something out of it, I know I've gotten a lot out of this NASA and the Navajo Nation space camp. Uh, another thing that I've done at the museum, and this is just by way of telling you some of the diverse things that I get to do. Um, we formed a band called the House Band of the Universe. <laughs> and for me, music has always been kind of my hobby, the thing that I do. It's not really part of my science. But then I had the opportunity now to uh, be, be in this band, and we, we play in planetariums. And here we are. I don't know how well you can see this, but the, the band sort of set up and lit low, and then we're projecting um, Saturn and the Cassini spacecraft. And, and, um, and we tell the story of the universe with music and images. And uh, we're actually trying to take this on tour. The show's called Life Out There. So watch for it coming to a planetarium near you. Anyway, so, so in my career, it's been, a, it's been a really fun balance of the scientific research, getting to be part of spacecraft teams, and then various communication and outreach activities. And it's, it's all been really fun. And I, a few years ago, I, I'm sort of going to show off here, but uh, a few years ago, I was recognized by my colleagues and given a medal, which was really exciting for me. It's called the, the Carl Sagan Medal. Uh, for excellence in public communication and planetary science. And here I am, here's my, my colleagues clapping and me getting the medal and going off and telling some stories or whatever. And uh, it was just, it's really nice that in the scientific community, in addition to worrying about the research, that um, the efforts that people do to communicate and teach are also recognized. So if you go into science, there, there are a lot of different directions, a lot of different um, what we call niches, you know, d different, different um, places in, in the scientific universe that you can actually end up doing interesting and fun things. So that's all I've got to say for now. Thanks a lot for listening. And we'll, uh, we'll have some more conversation a little later.
And I hope, you know, already I hope you can see that, you know, science can be a lot more than, you know, perhaps what you think. Um, you know, a lot of times when they have people draw a picture of a scientist, you know, a kid saying, what does a scientist look like to you? They draw this kind of guy with like wild hair and he's got like a white lab coat and mixing chemicals together. And, you know, I won't lie to you, that guy probably does exist. Somewhere right now there probably is a person with wild hair and a white lab coat mixing chemicals together. But that's just a tiny, tiny bit of what science is. And um, you guys are at the age right now where you can decide, you know, if, you're, if any of this seems interesting to you. Uh, you can do it. You know, this, it's, uh, in middle school, you still have time to make uh, decisions that would take you in some of these directions if uh, it seems kind of cool to you. So next, our next speaker is Marco Medone. He's an electronics engineer, works at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, he, is, he works in all sorts of new communications technologies that are used throughout NASA that make a lot of these missions possible. And he's in charge of coming up with them and how not only people communicate, but how machines communicate and send messages to one another. So please welcome Dr. Marco Medon. Okay, let's see. Hello, hello, hello. All right, you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Marco Midon. I did not bring a presentation, so you guys are going to have to listen because I heard about it last night and I don't do them that quick, so I don't have one. But um, So um, I work in, in basically communications, not like he was talking about, but like the art of sending things from one place to another. And, and the way I got into it, I, I grew up kind of in, a, in the country in a small town, and, um, and I was really fascinated with the radio. And I used to think there were people inside making music and stuff like that, so I'd take them apart looking for the people when I was like three or four. And I discovered, you know, there's no people inside. This thing is picking up something from far away. You know, there's people somewhere miles away talking, and I'm listening through this box, and I, I want to know how this box works. So very young, I got interested in communications, became a ham radio operator. You can, um, you can actually take a test and get a license, and you can use radio to communicate with people all over the world. So at 11 years old, I got my license, and I actually learned a lot about geography through it, because I had to learn where the heck are the Aleutian Islands, and you know, where is Japan, and where does, how does that relate to where I am? So that was really cool, so it made me learn about the world and all that. I was also interested in space, because you know, space is interesting, and what goes on out there, and how does it relate to us, and, and wow, that's the ultimate communications problem, right? I mean, communicating in space, I mean, how much better does it get, right? If you want to really go far away, right, you get your little walkie-talkie and you go out, can you read me, can you read me, and then you get out a certain distance and you can't hear them anymore. So I wanted to be involved in systems that get really far away. And so they make the missions, like David was talking about, possible. That's the way the images from Mars or from Venus or from Pluto, that's the way they get here. They get here through a communication system like I work on. They go through an antenna and they transmit through space. So just to give you an idea, so you, you know you've seen light bulbs and they have wattage on them, right? 100 watt bulb, 75 watt bulb. The, the spacecraft Voyager, which is outside of the solar system now, it's gone even further than all the planets. It's headed to interstellar space. That means like where the stars are. It's really far away. We're still receiving signals from it, and the transmitter on it is 20 watts, which is like a really dim light bulb, and we can still hear it from Earth. We have a system in California with a big dish antenna that's like 300 feet across, and it can hear that little weak 20-watt signal all the way from beyond the solar system. So that's, that's what I do. Um, I worked on um, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is a, a, a spacecraft that is now sending pictures of inside the sun. We want to know how the sun works, because the sun is what gives us life. It warms the Earth. Um, it's, um, you know, we want to know how it works. So we, we designed a spacecraft that 
um, can actually look inside the sun by actually listening to the sound waves that are coming from it. The sun puts out these, these high energy particles and sound is just the movement or the energy, a wave in a, in a particle. So they hit these instruments, these specialized instruments, and they take like an ultrasound of the inside of the sun. And it turns out there's lots of data. So I had to build a new communication system that actually is the highest volume of data or information that's ever been built. And it's up there now, taking pictures of the inside of the sun. I also worked on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, system, and that's mapping a map of the moon, the most detailed map ever. Every crater, every you know, mountain, everything on the moon is making a map of it. And my system sends back the, uh, the uh, information from that. So now back in 2008, I'm, I'm also, so I'm, I'm a ham radio operator as a hobbyist. So I do that as a hobby. I have a 70 foot antenna at home. If you go down I-95 between 216 and 198, you look over towards the east, you can see my antenna sticking up. It's big. It's, there's more concrete holding it up than there is in my house. So, you know, I'm pretty serious about this stuff. So, um, so a few years ago, so, so I also kind of have the reputation of being somebody that's kind of, you know, as a blind person, you gotta be willing to take risks. I mean, go outside and walk across the street, you might get killed, right? But what's the option not to do it? So I'm used to taking risks. So, you know, the United States, um, you know that the space shuttle is no longer flying. So there's, we are building another spacecraft that's gonna take people up there, but in the meantime, we're depending on the Russians to get to the space station. So we really care about how their spacecraft works and that it gets people down safely and all that. So a few years ago, they were having trouble with it. It, it started landing off course, you know, and, and, and they couldn't figure out why. And, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But basically, they didn't have a way of receiving the, the signal at the point that they needed to receive it. So they asked a bunch of people. No one wanted to touch it because there wasn't enough time, and it was a strange system that no one understood. It was also an old system. You know, the Russians, unlike us, you know, if it keeps working, they keep using it. And I kind of like that. You know, they don't have to change. If it keeps working, why change it, right? So they're using a system that was really, that we stopped using 30 years ago. So everyone forgot how it works. Well, I like old things. I like things, if they keep working, I want to use them. I don't need necessarily something new. Then I got to learn it all over again. And maybe it doesn't even work as good as the old stuff. So, so they came to me and they said, can you figure out how to get this, this thing, this data off of this thing? And you only have a week to do it, by the way. And you're going to be doing it somewhere in either Greece, Turkey, uh, Egypt, somewhere. We don't know yet. But you just you know, figure out how to do it, and then we'll tell you where you're going. I said, OK, well, let me see. So it was a Friday. So I, you know kind of studied it a little bit. I actually got some stuff off the web. Some guy took a, uh, an image of what the, what the signal looked like, and I said, yeah, I think I know how to do it. And I wrote an email and sent it out to everyone, and said, this is how I think we can do it. Does anybody you know, disagree with it? And they said, no, you, you know, we, we think you can do it. So I get on the phone, I call my ham radio buddies, and I said, I need this kind of, this kind of piece of equipment by Monday. I need this other thing by this day and all that. So, so Monday, I go to Wallops Island, which is near where I work. It's, it's on the eastern shore of Maryland. It's, you know, maybe a three-hour drive away. And, uh, and meanwhile, you know, because this is, this is very important, there's a lot of really high-level people are pick, figuring out how to get our passports, and people are figuring out, uh, you know, how to get the Russians to turn on the spacecraft at the right time. So they turn it on over Wallops, and I get my... My, uh, my system, um, and it, it, uh, it, it doesn't work the first time. So got to try again. So on Tuesday, I get another piece of equipment. We try it again, and it doesn't work. And then the third time we try it, and it works. Now, this is, you know, normally these systems take years to, to come up with and test and all that. This is something we had to put together in a couple of days. So I get it to work on Tuesday evening, and they say, all right, you're on a plane. You're going to Athens, Greece tomorrow, right, tomorrow. So I said, okay, you know, so I'm, I got with one other guy, I'm with one other guy, and we're going to go and we're going to set this equipment up on the roof of the United States Embassy and pick this thing up, right? So it's like, it's like 007, I mean, picking us up in black cars, and there's these guys that are following us around. I get a, a passport, which I can show you guys later, an official passport with all this special stuff all over it so I can get through customs and all this. <laughs> so so we, we get there, 
I get there on, on Wednesday, and we go, and um, we get to the airport, and you know how they're really picky about bags these days, right? What you take, how much you have to pay. So I paid 2,500 bucks in excess bags, right? That's, so it was more than one of the tickets. But one of the bags, over 100 pounds, they don't let you take it, no matter how heavy it is, or I mean, how much you pay. They don't let you take it. So we're like, well, what are you going to do? We, this thing's got to work by Friday. And it takes a day or a day and a half to get there. So they said, well, fly to Atlanta and call us. And if we can't figure out a way to get the equipment there, just come back. So fly to Atlanta. And they call me back. And they say, oh, um, another guy's going to come along. And he's going to take it along as his personal luggage. He's going to get there a little after you. So OK, fine. Now, meanwhile, so remember, the Russians don't tell us anything about their system. And I found out later it's because it was part of their ICBM. It was part of their system they used for making nuclear weapons. So it was secret. They didn't want to tell us about it. So we had to figure this out on our own without any information from them. Um, so, so, you know, they just expected us to figure this out. So we, you know, so I get there. Um, and, and we get up on the roof. And, and we, we uh, oh, and, and so we're... We're recording this, right? We're just we're using like a fancy video recorder, and we're recording this, and then we're going to give it to them, and they're going to interpret it. So I get there, and one of the video recorders got damaged on the trip. The other one is OK. Now, remember, because we didn't have this much time, this stuff got packed in cardboard boxes, right? We didn't have time for special crates, none of that. So, <laughs> so, the, so, so Friday morning comes now. This, this, is, this spacecraft is the Soyuz. It's called the Soyuz. It's the Russian version of like the space shuttle. It takes people up and down to space. And normally, a spacecraft's in orbit, which means it goes around and around and around. But when it's coming back in, it just goes by you once. It's coming. It's called re-entry. It comes back to Earth. So that means we only get one chance. We don't get to try this again if it doesn't work. Uh, and, and so. Uh, we're, we're, you know, it's coming in, and it's 4 o'clock in the morning. It's supposed to come around 6. We don't get any sleep, by the way. I mean, this is, you know. And the other video recorder craps out, and that's the last one we got. So I'm thinking, what do we do? Um, and this is very much about improvising. I mean, this is all about improvising. So I'm thinking, well, maybe we can take apart one of the video recorders that's already there in the embassy, and we can use that to record the data or something. And then I noticed that the thing... When you first turn it on, it comes on and then it stops working. I said, maybe it's, just, maybe it's not getting cooling. So I call up and I said, can we get a fan somewhere? So we get a fan out of one of the offices and we stick it on top of the, out of the thing. And there's actually, there's a website. Or if you put in um, my name, Marco Midon, and uh, NASA blind engineer, and the word Soyuz, S-O-Y-U-Z, you can see a whole article about it. And there's a picture of the setup that we had, including the fan on top of the... So the thing, you know, goes over and we catch the data. We get it. I mean, it was, it was amazing that it worked. There's a number, a whole bunch of stuff that could have gone wrong. So that was, that was an adventure. It really was an adventure. And then the next year, I got to go to McMurdo, Antarctica. Does anybody know where Antarctica is? You know where the South Pole is? So that's like, that's, there, there, no people live there. It's so cold and it's so kind of inhospitable that nobody lives there. But there's science there. There are people who do science from down there. They study the Earth. They study all kinds of things, you know, what's happening to the climate. There's all kinds of reasons people go down there. I was down there to put up a ground station to receive satellite weather information. So I got to go to McMurdo. Um, and that was, a, that was a really neat experience. Um, there's no place like it uh, anywhere. There's no animals, no insects. Um, there's, it, um, you're, there's only, sometimes when the weather's bad, there's no flights out of there. They make you pull all your wisdom teeth because there's no dentist down there. So if your teeth hurt, you, you know, you're just plain done, right? You know, it's, it's, it's very much like the old west maybe used to be, except that people aren't walking around with guns. But other than that, it's, you know, kind of old west-like. So that's kind of a, uh, some of the things that, that I get to do. Now what I'm doing is I'm actually working on new technologies, ways to get communications to be better and faster. Like those pictures from Mars. I mean, what if they were all really high res? What if they were all really high resolution? That would be really cool. 
Well, that's limited by communications, you know, right? Like you used to have, well, maybe you guys are probably too young to remember the old dial-up modems, but, but, you know, you probably all have, you know, Fios or something like that. But in the old days, we used to have really slow modems. You know, you could get a picture. It would take 10 minutes to get a picture down on your computer. Now you just hit it and boom, it's right there. So we want that same kind of thing from outer space, that kind of really good high resolution data, whatever, whether it's pictures or other things, and we want it to come fast. Now, Mars is so far away, radio waves and light all travel at the speed of light. Anybody know how fast that is? 186,000 miles in one second. So that means if you were in an airplane, you could go around the Earth seven times in one second. That's really fast. Well, at that speed, it takes a half an hour to get to Mars. That's a long way. The sun is nine minutes away at that speed. So if, if the sun were to go out now, it would take us nine minutes to know it happened. So light goes really fast, but even at the speed of light, Mars is 30 minutes away. Jupiter is an hour and a half away. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, so imagine, you know, building communication systems that are that good. And they have to be small enough to be able to put on the spacecraft, right? The spacecraft is there to gather science. So you can't take up all the space with a huge antenna and a big old heavy power supply. So it's got to be small and still work millions of miles away. So that's, that's what I do, and that's what I'm, I'm working. I work now. I keep a lab called the Communication Standards and Technology Lab at Goddard. And we figure out new ways to, to transmit um, information and transmit it fast and transmit it um, with, you know, light, um, efficient spacecraft. So uh, that, that kind of gives you an idea, um, some of the things I've done and some of the things I've gotten to do. It's been a really neat job. Um, um, I got to go back to do the Soyuz thing again, and I got to take my wife this time because I had more than, like, two days' notice. <laughs> so that was fun. So, 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 so science can be fun. Um, you get to do a lot of interesting things. And you guys should definitely think, think about it. Thank you. All right. Well, now our last speaker also works at Goddard Space Flight Center, also works in communications, but communications of a very different sort, closer to what you probably you know, might first think of. She communicates to the public, to others, about the science that goes on there. And uh, you just heard about the McMurdo, space, uh, McMurdo uh, um, Station down in Antarctica. Her interest, her specialty, is in polar regions. So please welcome Maria Jose Vinyas. <laughs> Hi, good morning everybody. So I am a science writer and I write about NASA. When you hear of NASA, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Space and astronauts, right? <laughs> but to me and to many people, I think one of the most interesting things that NASA studies is our own planet. This is what one of the first astronauts that went to the moon said. We came all this way to explore the, Earth, the moon, and the most important thing we, that we discovered is the Earth. And how does NASA study the Earth? Exactly. Oh, wait. <laughs> OK, so these are all the satellite missions that are currently uh, NASA satellite missions. There are also satellites from other agencies. But these are the NASA satellite missions that are orbiting the Earth. And Susan uses some of them. Uh, she has used. Um, Aqua and Landsat. Uh, I work with scientists that use GRACE, which is a gravity mission, and also ISAT, which is already dead, but we are look, gonna launch a replacement in 2016. And the satellites, the scientists I work with study the polar regions of the Earth, which are also in the postcard that I gave you. Here's Greenland, and here's Antarctica. And these are regions that are constantly frozen. Uh, there are two types of ice in there. One is the ice on land, 
And then there's also the ice on the sea, which is the sea ice, which is frozen water. And it grows and shrinks. In the winter, it grows, the sea ice, and in the summer, it melts. But over the years, with climate change, this ice is disappearing. And why do we care about it? Because it has an impact on the rest of the Earth's climate. So here are some of my scientists. They are very adventurous. They go to the poles. They ride uh, snowmobiles. They get frozen ice flashes because it's really cold in there. And we also send robots. This is a Curiosity's cousin. It's called Grover. And it's, actually in Green it's currently in Greenland exploring the ice shed. Uh, so I work with the scientists, but I'm a science writer. What do I do? Does anybody have a guess? Yes? Exactly. And I see my work as a translator. OK, scientists, not these who have spoken here, who are very well spoken because they are used to talk to, to the public. But most of the scientists are very, very focused in their field of study. And they lose perspective of what the people know about what they study. So they start using very technical terms. And they assume you already know what, what they're talking about. But you don't, because it's very, very specific. So they write these papers that they publish in journals for their colleagues. And they are highly technical. And somebody has to go and read them and understand it and think about why should the general public care about these discoveries? How does it impact their lives? So that's me. I'm the bridge between what the scientists write for other scientists and what you learn normally through the news. So I'm kind of in between the scientists and the journalists. And I also help them to communicate to the public directly. Like I, I, I help them blog, or I help them learn to shoot video or take pictures when they go on their expeditions. And how do you think I ended up working for NASA? What do you think I studied? It was not a very straightforward path. So this is me in 2000. I was a veterinarian, and I worked with pigs. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I worked in farms for several years and also worked in research. I studied a virus that affects pigs. And uh, I suddenly decided that this is not what I wanted to do with my life. And I was quite upset because I had spent many, many years in school, and I didn't want to do it. So what did I want to do? That was more difficult to figure out. So I thought, uh, I really like writing, and I really like reading. Is there anything I could make a living reading and writing? And I thought, maybe I could be a journalist. So I went back to school, and I studied journalism in Spain, where I'm from. And um, I started working as a journalist. I was covering economics because I didn't want anything to do with science again because I was so uh, <laughs> uh, fed up with uh, veterinary medicine. But one day, they asked me to interview a biologist. And uh, I went there, and he was the most enthusiastic person in the world. And he was really passionate about what he was doing. And he sat with me for hours telling me about everything he did. And I thought, this is great. Why I'm denying myself this? to work with scientists and explain what they do to the public. So I went back to school for the third time. <laughs> I went to UC Santa Cruz. They have a program where you learn to write about science specifically for the public. And uh, when I finished, I had a job with a, a large scientific association. And then I finally got my job at Goddard. And this is me in 2012 in Greenland over the, one of the glaciers in there. And now uh, that's what I do. I write about polar science for the public. And so my career advice is based on my experience. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't have to know in middle school what you want to be. And also later in life, you might not know what you want to be, and it's OK, too. I didn't know until my 30s. Um, <laughs> it's OK if you suddenly decide to change careers. Uh, no knowledge is lost. Later in life, you will find out what, whatever you studied, how you can apply it to your job. So my advice is follow whatever you like to do and find an application later in life. And that's all I had to do. Uh, 
So if you have questions now or later, you can find me on Twitter. Um, my personal account is MJ Venus. I don't know if you use Twitter, but uh, I thought that maybe you do. And the other is NASA is where I put all the, all the polar related uh, news from NASA. Thank you. I wish. <laughs> if you're thirsty, there's a glass of water more or less right in front of you on the table here. There you go. Oh, right. Yeah, me neither. All right. So now we've come to the time in our presentations where you guys get to ask questions. And uh, the way we're going to do it is have uh, you, if you have a question, rather than everybody put up their hands, um, we'd like to get you actually on microphones so you could be heard. Um, so, uh, if you could, uh, you know, with, with help from your, uh, your teacher, uh, go to the microphones if you have a question and just line up in an orderly way and we'll just go back and forth and take questions from you. So, uh, and also, this is a good time to remind our audience uh, listening from afar that if you have questions, type them into chat. And uh, we will repeat them here and get those answered as well. All right. Any questions? All right. There you go. Don't be shy. All right. There's going to be a floor. This is important without, yeah. without you guys. We got, we got right. nothing to talk about. Uh, I have uh, a question. Right here, question on the right, nice and loud. Do you guys study dwarf planets and figure out is any more in the universe? Dwarf planets. Dwarf planets? Are you asking if they study them? Yes, and do you guys try to figure out is any more out there? Or are there any more out there, dwarf planets? Yes, um, that is one thing we study, and as I mentioned, we have um, a spacecraft on its way to Pluto now, so we're going to have our first ever really up close look at a dwarf planet in July 2015. That we're going to get that spacecraft's going to get to Pluto, and then as uh, so that's going to be really exciting because we'll see what that looks like up close, and it's, uh, it it should be really cool. So stand by for that in um, just a uh, uh, couple years. And then um, as far as discovering more dwarf planets out there, yeah, we. We're just we're finding more all the time um, with uh, telescopes fr from Earth um, doing these surveys and um, looking for little dots that are moving in in the sky and then going back and making sure you've really found one and checking the orbit and uh, then seeing what we can learn about them. It's tricky because they're far away. They're out in the outer part of our solar system. These dwarf planets, but our telescopes are getting better and better. So it is something we're finding more of all the time, and, and uh, it's kind of exciting because it's, a, it's sort of a new frontier now. It's a part of our solar system we didn't even know existed a few years ago that now we're finding is full of a lot of objects. Cool. All right, we have a lot of questions. Thank you. So I'm just going to quickly, I'm going to go right over to here. What do you guys like about your job? Oh, we, everybody should uh, answer this one. What do you like about your job? Uh, we'll um, just start. Uh, uh, we'll start with Susan right here on the right. We'll go right, uh, right across. Well, one of the things I like the most about my job is that I get to work with human rights organizations. So I get to talk to people that are interested in science that aren't scientists and help them figure out ways that I can help them to document things that, they're, that they want to show that are happening. So one of the things I like most is getting to talk to people that live all over the world and know very specific things about different parts of it. And then we work together to create these really cool projects that help people learn about what's going on. All right, David? Well, I like that I'm helping discover new things that nobody's ever known before. And I like that I get to work on teams of people uh, and you sort of feel this 
the sense of teamwork where you have your, you know, your comrades and your work for years on these projects and they work or they don't work, but you, get, you kind of bond with the other people. And, and I like that, like I said before, in a certain sense, um, I feel like I've never really had to go to work, uh, which may sound funny because I spend a lot of hours at my job, but because I get to do things that I basically feel are fun and exciting, I feel like I get away with something. Like, wow, I get paid to do what I want to do. So that's really not bad. OK, Marco. OK, um, so I, I feel the same way. Um, you know, I sort of turn my hobby into my job, which is good and bad. Sometimes, you know, I might have to get another hobby that's completely different. But, you know, I love anything to do with radio and communication. So I love the fact that I get to do it and get paid for it. It's also cool that I get to travel around a lot get to meet a lot of interesting people. Um, I write the fact that we, you know, we're trying to make the world a better place. You know, maybe the Solar Dynamics Observatory will discover something about the sun that we can use to solve our energy problem, for instance. You know, if we could make a, a something that's like the sun that makes energy, then maybe we wouldn't have energy problems. We wouldn't have to worry about the price of gasoline anymore and stuff like that. So I like that all of those kind of things are tied up in the job. All right, and Maria Jose? Yeah, I like two things. One is that I get to work with NASA scientists who are really smart, really passionate, and they don't mind sitting with me for hours telling me about what they do. Uh, the second is that I really care about the stuff I write about, which is the polar environment, and uh, I am communicating to the public what's going on in there, all the problems that they have, and I hope that through this we'll be more aware and uh, we'll end up finding ways to prevent all these problems happening. All right, and make sure your microphone is on. I'm not sure everybody's mic is on, by the way, just to be sure. There's and a switch on Right the over box. here. That's right, question over here on my right. Good morning. Hi. Um, I have a question that uh, I recently uh, looked online and found out that there could be possibly life on Mars uh, late in the later years. Is this true? Life on Mars, is it true? In, in the, what was the second part of your question? Uh, is this true? Like, oh, well, what we, found it, yeah. what we found is that um, there's, we found a lot of good evidence that Mars used to have an environment where life could have existed. And that's pretty exciting, that Mars early in its history had a lot of water and a warmer environment and was much more like the Earth, especially like the Earth at the time when we think life was first starting as these chemical reactions in sort of warm place. So we found a lot of evidence that, that Mars could have been a place where there was life. We have not yet found evidence of life. That doesn't mean that we won't, but we're still looking for that. Okay, great. And question right over here. Have any of you ever seen Mercury and how is it similar to Earth? See Mercury, the planet Mercury. Yes. Oh well, do you guys? You might want to do. I that could. I could talk about that a little bit. Sure. It's. Uh, it's. It's. Uh, I've seen the. You know the images that are coming down, and actually, um, there's a website where you can see it in Google Earth, and so Earth disappears and Mercury appears instead. And if you go to messenger-education.org, you teachers will know that, you can actually click to that and actually you can see Mercury close up. But it's similar to Earth, which is kind of interesting in that it has a magnetic core. You know, we have uh, compasses work here and they tell north from south. Um, that would work on Mercury too. And there's way bigger of it there. So they think maybe that's because Mercury was bigger and the outer part got blasted away or something or somehow it was gone and just left that really hard metal core. And um, you know, and the other thing that's really interesting about the about Mercury is learning about how it formed is informing how the entire solar system formed because it's the closest to the sun. It has a, you know, it's kind of the bookend. You know, you got the outer planets and you got Mercury all the way in. And understanding those lets you know a lot about how our whole solar system and even Earth formed. So um, that's some of the cool. Oh, and they found water on Mercury. Believe it or not, that it's that close to the sun. It's got ice on it hidden in little craters that are shielded from the sun. So that's pretty cool. And, and by the way, just if I can add one more thing on the subject of whether anybody's seen Mercury, Mercury is one of the planets you can see yourself in the sky with your naked eye if you know where and when to look. 
And it just so happens that Mercury is visible right now, I mean, this month in the evening sky in the west. It's hard to see. Mercury's always hard to see because since it's so close to the sun, it never gets very high in the sky where it's dark. But if you look just after sunset and you're in a place where the sky's pretty dark, which sometimes hard to do when you're in the city here, but this month, later this month, there are three planets right in the west, Mercury, Venus and Jupiter are all near each other in the sky, which is kind of rare. So if you get a chance and it's pretty clear and pretty, pretty good um, ability to see the western sky sometime, you might get a chance to see Mercury yourself. Yeah, and in the Washington Post on the metro section in the back, it tells you where you can look to see those planets every day. So, all right, question over here. Uh, good morning, my name is Tyree Allen. Hey. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the probability of it being another planet like Earth in the universe. <laughs> another planet like Earth, okay. You got a thought of that, about that? Uh, I mean, I don't have a, a number. What I'll say is that um, because of our ability to detect planets, and we're detecting more and more of them every day, we used to think they were really rare, and the evidence is now starting to point towards that there may be a lot more of them uh, because we're starting to find, we're, we're just getting to the point where we can detect planets the size of the Earth around other stars. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. And by the way, the way these detection systems work when you're that far away, you don't actually see the planet, you see the star. And it turns out that the planet, that if two, if two bodies are close to each other, there's gravity that one pulls on the other. So you actually look at the star and you see it wobble a little and you say, well, that's caused by something else we can't see that's there. And that's how we can actually see planets around other stars that are really far away. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's very brand new knowledge that now we know there are planets out there. When, when, when you were born, we didn't know that not too many years ago. And now we know that most of the stars out there have planets. So we think that there probably are some that are a lot like Earth. There, there should be, but we're just getting to the point where we can investigate that. Yeah, these are things that you guys can investigate because these are brand new questions that, you know, will still be interesting when you guys are, are in college. Over here. Dr. Wolfenbarger, do you ever feel as though you're invading people's privacy? Oh, <laughs> oh that's, that's a, well, that's a good question. So the, the satellites that we use, there's all different types of resolution. So I was showing you some high resolution satellite imagery. And with that, so you can see certain levels of detail, but you can't see personal details. You can't see things that are happening in between people with the satellites that we have access to. So you're not invading people's personal privacy and there's this whole set of laws and there's been a bunch of court cases and things about determining whether satellites do invade people's personal privacy and legally they don't <laughs> is the answer. And I feel like the in the work that I do, the benefits outweigh some of the concerns with that, you know, in terms of being able to make people around the world aware of what's going on. I think if, you know, if you lived somewhere very far away and something bad was happening to you, it would be great, if, you know, to have someone be able to get a satellite image and to be able to tell other people about it. So yeah. that's kind of my take on and it. And that, that's an important thing to think about now because even if right now we can't see personal things in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they'll be able to you yeah. know, count your teeth from space. Yeah. So I mean, we've only had you this, have to think about it now. Yeah, the satellites that I use have only been around for about 12 years. And so in the next 10 years, we'll really have to start wondering about questions about you know being able to see what's happening between people so you'll have to ask that question again <laughs> that that's why i wear the hat by the way to shield myself <laughs> from satellites <laughs> <laughs> and right here another question um my question is how do you guys use math in um, your job use math yeah yeah mathematics that's a great question or do you use, we're assuming you do use mathematics. Do you use we, math? we do use math in, uh, in remote sensing. Um, there's a lot of calculations that you do when you're doing analysis on satellite imagery to determine different things, like if you're trying to detect vegetation death or things like that. So there is some built-in math 
um, that's within the systems that I use, but I don't have to get out any paper and pencil and do anything like that very often. I think okay. You guys might. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I use math all the time in my job um, in a lot of ways. Um, for one thing, well, I mean, I don't do the engineering stuff, and I think we're going to hear about that in a second, because <laughs> the engineers use, I mean, they get the spacecraft to the planets, and they have to do, use a lot of math to design the, you know, the trajectory and how long you're going to fire the rockets, and you know, there's a lot of math problems to solve to make a spacecraft work. But I'm not actually an engineer. I don't build the spacecraft. But as a scientist, I use math to understand what we're seeing. Um, I, I do models, which are, we construct these computer models, which are basically almost like computer games, where you're putting in certain things and seeing what happens. But we try to make it as realistic as possible using the information we're getting from other planets. So um, I, I basically, almost everything I do involving processing the information from spacecraft and trying to make sense of it is putting it into equations and using math to see, help us see what it really means. Dr. Madone, do you ever use math? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, that, that's about, I mean, that is the fundamental basics of what I do. I mean, so for instance, okay, you want to make a communication system that's going to communicate with Mars. Well, you know, you got to do all kinds of math. How much power do you need? How big does the antenna, you know, the bigger the antenna is, the less power you need. How far is it? And then something called attenuation. When you send a signal over a distance, it gets weaker and weaker. You know, if you turn your flashlight on and then walk away from it, it gets dimmer and dimmer, and at some point you can't see it anymore. So that whole, there's an equation for that. There's an equation for how much gain the antenna has, which is, you know, how, how it concentrates the signal, the power. I mean, there's math, everything. And then when you're designing the systems, um, so, that, you know, there's literally math in every aspect of what you do in an engineer, as an engineer, in terms of um, the way that, you know, you can tell whether a system's going to work by doing a mathematical calculation. Um, you can predict things with mathematics. You can't even design a system without mathematics, because that's how you represent all the different things, is with numbers and what, how they relate to each other. And I don't do this, but like he was saying, you know, if you're going to shoot a spacecraft at Mars, you have to actually figure out where Mars is going to be when that spacecraft gets there. If you shoot it at it where you see it right now, by the time it gets there, Mars isn't going to be there. So that's called flight dynamics. So there's tons of math where you're figuring out the motions of the planet and the motion of the spacecraft and the gravitational pull the spacecraft had that is getting from the Earth and the moon and all this other stuff. So yeah, math is everywhere. <laughs> There's, I was going to say, the, you know, math, when you're doing something you don't care as much about, like, you know, you have a car traveling this way and a car traveling this way and when will they meet? It isn't, but if you're doing, if you're solving a problem you really care about, math is really, really fun. I mean, it's really neat when you, and then you solve it and it works, it's just like, it's like sinking a three point, you know, getting a nothing but net or meeting a baseball where it just jumps off the bat. It's this feeling like, yes! And so uh, it, it, really is, it really is a cool thing, and especially, you know, when you really care about what you're doing. So right over here. Um, this, is go this goes to Mr. Maiden. Are you, like, able to work even with your disability? Yeah, so, okay, so yeah, there's a number of things that I do to enable me to work. So for, I have a computer that talks to me, and I actually have it here. I don't know if we'll have time to turn it on. And, but, so it has a very sophisticated piece of software that speaks things on the screen. So like I, can, like I use Excel spreadsheets, to, for instance, to do what I was talking about with the antenna gain and all. It's actually called a link budget. So it's, it's kind of like you know, money. There's certain things that add to it, and there's certain things that take away. So you add them all up together on the Excel spreadsheet. My thing tells me what, you know, what's going on. I have um, a, a program that will allow me to use an instrument called a spectrum analyzer, which is just a way to um, tell what's going on with radio signals. So there's all, basically there's technology bridges the gap um, that, that I lose with, with vision. Now, unfortunately, Technology, and I'm not going to go really into the technology is kind of going in a direction that's not good for me these days. You know, imagine if you close your eyes and pick up your iPhone and try to use it. You're not going to be able to do anything with it. There's no buttons on it. There's nothing. It's a smooth brick. So touchscreens are a real problem. 
and you know, we'll see how, how, how that gets solved. But in general, technology really helps people with disabilities. Yeah. And actually, I have a question, just because uh, Maria Jose has not had a question yet, and I, don't, I want you to feel included, and this is something that, um, that I think is really interesting. When you're communicating science, when you're, you have to talk to people in fields you don't know anything about, how do you take these technical papers and translate them so regular people like us can understand what the scientists are talking about? How do you, you, know, how do you, how do you plunge into that? Well, there are several ways to do it. The first is to find the practical application of the new findings. How are they gonna impact your lives? So I try to explain that. So when I say that Greenland is melting, why would you care about that? You don't care about that, about the polar bears. I mean, you might like polar bears, but I mean, they're far away and mm -hmm. you can always see one in a zoo. But if Greenland melts, the sea level is gonna rise. And if you live by the coast, you're gonna notice that because it's gonna destroy buildings and all that. So that's one thing. The other thing I try to communicate is the enthusiasm of the scientists, why they think this is important. You know, one thing about polar bears, they're one of the few animals that actually think of you as dinner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a place that, that, that I, I've gone to called Svalbard. It's an island off of Norway. And they, you cannot leave the town without either a shotgun or somebody with you with a shotgun because the polar bears do like to eat human beings. Yeah, and it might be because their prey is disappearing too. So. Well, when you're up there, you can't be that picky about what you eat. If it's warm and it's moving, you eat it, right? <laughs> All right, right here. Do you, do you guys enjoy your jobs? Just say it again? Do you guys enjoy your jobs? Do you enjoy your job? What does it uh -oh. look like? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Enjoying your job is so important or else it's going to really feel like a job. You want to, if you're going to be doing something for 40 or more hours a week, you want it to be something that you're really interested in. And so I, I actually, I was going to mention this in my talk, and one way to figure out if something is a career that you're going to be interested in, a great way is to do internships when you get in college. And that's actually how I got started working here at AAAS was through an internship. So I, you know, I thought, oh, I really like the idea of studying human rights, and I like doing satellite imagery analysis. So I found a place that did that, and I went and did an internship, so I got some practical knowledge of what it would be like to do that on a day-to-day -day basis, and I found out, hey, I do like to do this. And so then I was able to go ahead with that, and I felt comfortable with making that my career. Yeah, I agree with her 100%. If, think about this, you know, so you gotta sleep you know, depending on who you are, six, eight, ten hours a day. So take that away, and then eight hours a day of the rest of the time you're working. So think about how much life's going to suck if you don't like your job. I mean, you're going to be doing it most of the time. Yeah. I mean, it's the biggest. When they say, oh, you know, stay in school, study, you know, learn a lot of stuff. And a lot of people say, then that way you'll make a lot of money. But really, the most important thing is that way you'll probably be able to get a job that you enjoy doing, and that's... And you'll make more money anyway, if you're because you'll be better you'll at it money. if you do something you like. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I think we only have time for maybe one more question, because we have to also... Um, uh, we, you know, there, there's more to the program. There's this great art exhibit that we want to leave you time to be able to see uh, that's here. So I'm just going to take one more question uh, off to my right. Are there any... Are there any programs for middle school age kids that might be interested in working for NASA? Oh, programs for middle school students who might be interested in working for NASA. I think there are programs for high school students, but middle school, I'm not sure. But you can go to the website and look at the internships uh, page. We could, you know, they have experiences and they have um, uh, discovery days and they have things like that, but we can look into that and let your teachers know what things there are that are available. There is, I know, a program um, that goes all the way down to middle school, I think, where you can help design experiments that are gonna fly in spacecraft. It's like a big competition thing. Um, so I can get more information on that too. But I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, so, but thank you very much. And you know what? Our scientists are going to be here afterwards, and so you can talk to them directly if you have any, uh, any more questions. Okay, so now.
and I'm not exactly sure how we're going to organize this. So uh, please go back to your seats. I'm, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to more questions. But we are going to, uh, in an orderly fashion, take a look at a great art show by a, a New York-based artist called Michael Benson, who takes imagery from space and creates these beautiful photographs. And you know, I just wanted to mention before you see them, you know, you just see these pictures of Saturn or you see these pictures of Mars or whatever and think, oh, it, someone just snapped it, like with a camera. But actually, the satellites mostly are taking tiny, tiny, tiny little pictures of little bits of it because the scientists aren't just interested in getting a big picture of the planet. They want a lot of detail. They want to be able to look right down to, you know, to see processes that are happening on the surface. And so they take zillions of little pictures and then they're put together. It's called a mosaic, kind of like a puzzle, one of those, you know, like an incredibly complicated puzzles that you spread out on a table and put everything together. But they have mathematical algorithms that help them do this. And then they can put together whatever view they want. And they're doing it for their own scientific reasons, but Michael Benson does it for artistic reasons. And so he gets sections of these, this data and decides, oh, I want to see Saturn from here, and I want this uh, you know, uh, planet, I mean, this uh, satellite that's going around it to be here. And he gets all that and puts it together into these beautiful images that we're going to see in a little while. But first, I would like once again uh, to thank our guest speakers. <laughs> Susan Wolfenbarger, David Grinspoon, Marco Madone, Maria Jose Diaz. Thank you very much. And great. And so we are going to, uh, I think, uh, well, you'll, we'll get instructions from uh, 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 your teachers here on how to line up and get ready. And we're going to have um, uh, books that are available. Uh, for your schools on space science that are uh, donated through Science Books and Films, through the Subaru Book Awards. Uh, Subaru helps, uh, uh, they sponsor a competition we do each year for the best science books for kids. And we have a collection of those, uh, thanks to them, for you, for your schools. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you again very soon.